Onigata. This is Jeff Corntassel, and welcome to a special episode of Frontlines Are Everywhere, which was taped on unceded Lekwungen and Wasanich territory on Orange Shirt Day, September 30th, 2024. Our guest on this podcast, Flora Northwest, is a Cree survivor of Ermanskin Residential School. I first met Flora recently at the 10th anniversary of the Buffalo Treaty in Standoff, Alberta. And during this time, she expressed a, a deep desire to share her story of strength and resilience with a wide audience. This is Flora's story as she wanted it told. And we work closely with her on this podcast to ensure that it is told in her own words. With that said, this episode contains details about Flora's trauma, sexual abuse, sexual assault, and violence that she experienced in residential schools which may be triggering to some listeners. Given these potential triggers, if you do not currently have the ability to engage with Flora's story, we encourage you to join us at a future time when you feel more supported. Also, please call the crisis line at 1-866-925-4419 if you or someone you know is triggered while listening to this episode. Wado, thank you. Osio Nagata. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Frontlines Are Everywhere podcast, uh, the podcast that looks at Indigenous internationalism, uh, self-determination, and resurgence uh, around Turtle Island and around the world. Uh, my name is Jeff Korntassel. I'm from Cherokee Nation, and we're really pleased to have our guest today, Flora Northwest. Uh, Flora is from Samson Cree Nation and a survivor of Ermanskin Residential School in Alberta. Uh, Flora was six years old when she was taken away from her family, her culture, and her community. Uh, Flora also says that part of her role as an elder and as a survivor is to share her story of resilience and decolonization uh, with others. And I've heard some of Flora's story. It's a really powerful one. And I'm really excited that she's pleased to share that with you. Uh, in Flora's own words, I've really worked hard on myself to overcome the pain to overcome that dark side of my life, to become who I am today as a mother, as a community member, and as a survivor of, a survivor of residential school and a survivor of alcoholism. And I'm proud to be the person I am today. So we're honored to have you today, Flora. And I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself. Thank you. Welcome to Treaty Six Territory because this is where I was born and raised. I was born to, uh, my parents were Alice and or Archie Northwest. I had 15 siblings. And the majority of us all went to the residential school. My mom and dad were residential school survivors. So with my dad, with my mom, myself, I became probably the second generation with my parents. Then my kids were the third generation, but they went to day school to the same school that I went to. But as a child, I was six years old when they took me to the residential school. I didn't understand a word of English. I never saw any white people in my life. And I was screaming and crying and kicking, telling my mom and dad I didn't want to stay. I wanted to go home. I said, no, you have to stay. They told me in Cree, you have to stay. He said, if I if you don't stay, is that they're gonna put us in jail? I didn't know what jail was, not knowing that's what I was gonna go into into an institution. So, and then this girl came over and said to me, "You have to come with me." And she talked to me in Cree, and said, "I'm only allowed to talk to you in Cree now, and after this, I won't be able to talk to you. Every every time you speak." The Cree language is that you're going to get strapped. And I got really scared. That was my first trauma. So I went in, you know, I was, didn't know I could not, I don't know how I survived. I don't even know how I asked to go to the bathroom. It's time 
going on. They'd only taught us four R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, and religion. But religion was number one. I think we used to pray at least 18 times a day. Every turn, every time we did something, we had to pray. We prayed when we got up in the morning. We prayed when we ate breakfast, prayed after breakfast. Everything that we did, we had to pray. And I don't know what I was talking about praying, but you know, it was that's all they taught us was religion. We all we did a lot of work. We were I always when I look back now, we went through a lot of child slavery. We had to learn how to work. It was labor. The food that we ate was gross. We had big gardens. We had to clean the gardens. We had chickens. We had eggs. But none of us, we never ate those. It was always the priests and the nuns and their staff. The only time we had good dinner or whatever was when the federal officials would come and visit the school. And, and this is how they, they showcased us to the federal government with food. And that was only probably once a year we got, you know, because the officials would come out and check the school. And there was a priest. As we got older, as I got older, probably about 10, 12. And he got really friendly with us. And he, we call him, you know, the priest with wandering hands. Because every time he would come and get close to us, you know, he would start molesting us. And he would, he was a Cree speaker, Frenchman. He smoked, he, it was ugly. He'd come to, I know I, there was so many times he'd come near me and he'd start touching me and, and he would call me my child, my child in Korea. It was, it was horrible. And he did that to so many girls. Because of the school, I was ashamed to talk. I didn't know who I was. I didn't speak my language, although I knew my language. I was ashamed of who I was because of what the school did to us. And, you know, it was horrible. But we were conditioned to believe as to what we were and who we were. Because of the how we were treated at the school, we were treated pretty, we were abused. We were assault, you know, we, we went through a lot of physical, emotional, mental abuse. But we, I never talked about the sexual abuse because that was one of the things that happened with that priest. I didn't talk about it. I didn't tell anybody about it. But there was also some sexual abuse that happened in the dorms. The girls were, you know, they were abusing us as well, some of the older girls. And I never said anything about that because I didn't want to get strapped if I told somebody about it. And so when I left school, I left everything behind. I didn't want to take that with me. I thought I was going to have a new start. I gave, you know, got involved into a relationship that didn't last because it seemed like I was attracted to trauma. I was attracted to alcohol, you know, with these guys. And I ended up with the first guy that I, I went with and I had a child with him and I left him because he was an alcoholic. I think it was about 1968 when I took my first drink and and I got sick. And I didn't like it. But this guy that I was with, I, I was going through domestic violence and I didn't know how to get, get out of it. So the only way out for me at the time was to start drinking. And I drank and I was still working. In 1970, February 17th of 1974, I had enough. I still had a job. I had enough of this drinking. My poor kids. They could have been apprehended through, through child welfare. But it was my mother that was there to support me, to look after my kids for me while I was drinking. 
on the morning that day on February the 17th, 1974. That was the day I, I went home and I my kids wouldn't even come near and I, they didn't even have a spark in their eyes. And I said, oh my God, what did I do to my kids? This is one, just, I didn't want this. I, said, I didn't want to do this to my kids. That's the day I decided to quit. And I said, okay, I'm not going to drink anymore. Next day, I made a call. I was in contact with counseling services before that, but I was always on denial. But I always, always remembered that number. So the next day, I phoned that number. I phoned my boss. And I told him, I need some time off. And his name was Bob. Hey, Bob, I said, I need time off. He said, what for? You've taken a lot of time off. I said, I think I have a drinking problem. I want to do something about it. And he said, go for it. I'll give you all the time in the world you need. When you come back, I'll give you a, a real good raise. Okay. So that morning, the next morning, I phoned. And I, and I said, it was probably about minus 40. And I was so sick. And I told that receptionist, I said, if nobody comes here in half an hour, I'm going to start walking. I said, I'm so sick. I said, I need a drink. And that lady said, don't worry. He said, we'll have somebody there for you. Sure enough, within half an hour, I had somebody at my door, at my mom's door. And then he talked to me, he said, you need help? And I said, yes, I do. But I remember him being, he used to drink a lot too. Eh? And he had been sober for about five years when he came to my door. And I told my mom, mom, I'm going to go. I want to sober up. I said, I want to go. And he looked at him and he told her, I'll help, we'll help her. My mom said, okay. I said, could you look after the kids again? He said, yes, go for help. And I went, I still had those, um, I had a lot of fear, uh, unknown fear. And I tried to figure out why did I become a drunk? Why? I never wanted to be a drunk. And here I am. I'm a drunk. We went, came home, went to the band meeting. And I said, they gave me a house. And they said, if you ever go back drinking again, he said, we'll take your house back. I said, okay, thank you. That year in 1974, that's when I, 1973 was when I first started. I wanted to go back to my culture, to my identity. And I had trouble, but I went to my first Sundance ceremony in 1974. I was, I had been drinking. I told my mom I had to go in there and she said, no, you're not ready. I still went. God, it was hard because I had a hangover. But she helped me. She did the giveaway for me. And then the next year was when I sobered up. And then that following year in 1974, I went back to the Sundance and I did my ceremony. In that lodge, that was the only time I made a commitment to the grandfathers, to the grandmother. This was going to be my journey. If I stay sober, I'll be back next year. And I didn't promise to anybody. So I did. And I finished my first year sobriety and I went back. Finally, it came to four years and I did my four years of uh, Sundance. And that was probably the beginning of, of my going forward. In 2000, in 1992, we did the study of the residential school. I said, I've been there. Not knowing the impact was going to, how that residential school was going to cost me you know, to relive the trauma, to relive the, the you know, the, the different abuses that I went through. And we did a study of, you know, one month we did that study. And he was a good teacher. He was a good professor. His name was uh, um, Dr. Walter Lightning. He was from our reserve. After we were done with that, I used to say, tell him, why did you do this to us? Why? He said, I'm sorry, but I think it's going to help you. I'd be so mad at him and he said, we'll talk about it. 
he was so calm and gentle. And he got us a psychologist and and I was so angry with the federal government how I came to understand about colonization, how our people were conditioned from the schools, the different abuses we all went through. I still didn't talk about my sexual abuse back then. I didn't want to, but I talked about the other abuses. And I thanked him for, for the study because I was able to understand what happened, why they came up with the diff with the residential school. They were going to uh, kill every Indian. They were going to kill every Indian child with their teachings. They were going to take away everything that a child was born with, with the culture, with the language. And that was their goal. And um, the day, you know, the industrial schools were the first ones that came in. My grandfather was such a mean old man. I just, I found out after that, that he was a student with from the industrial schools. And then my mom and dad, so I'm um, the one, two, I'm the third generation. My kids are the fourth generation. And they said they were gonna, it was going to take seven generations to break the cycle. After doing that study, knowing that it's going to take seven generations to, for our people to get better, I worked hard. I said, no, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to make sure that my kids are not going to be a part of this. I'm going to take care of me first, and then I'll take care of my kids. But when I first, when we first started the resident, residential school study, I made supper for them. By this time, they're all teenagers, and I said, "I need, I need to meet with you guys. I, I have to. I'm calling up a meeting." I said. So I told them my story, and I said, "I want to ask for your forgiveness." I said. You know, all these years, I said I was mother superior. Those were the only parenting skills that I had was from the school because this is how they treated us at the school, yelling at us every morning till we went to bed. Every time I'm going to raise my voice, I said, I want you to say something to me and just say, Mom, remember? Then this way I will, I'll be okay. You know, I'll, I'll be able to, you know, not yell at you guys. I said, thank you. Thank you for helping me. I said, how, you know, thank you for for um, overcoming a lot of the trauma that I had and causing, you know, giving that to you, I said. And I'm really proud of my my sons, my daughter, for who they are and as parents. They've done a great jo job. And my son became a band leader for about 20 years. He got into band council. One day I heard him speak at the wake and he told everybody there, he said, I just want to remind you, all of you as parents is that as young parents, we only have one chance. We have only one chance to be parents. So let's make the best of it. Let's get our kids educated. Let's help support our kids. Let's be there for our children. Support them all the way into high school, into university. And then you've done your job as a parent, he told the parents. I said, Oh my God. And he did that. And then one day I did a program, you know, it was a self, um, it was a personal safety program for kids. And that personal safety program was to, you know, to develop an awareness about um, personal safety where nobody, you know, the kids wouldn't go through any sexual abuse. When I introduced that program to the classrooms, there were so many kids that were victims of sexual abuse, molestation. And I've always said for all of you that may be working with students, for all of you that may be listening to me, listen to 
a child because every child is every child matters because that child is going to educate you i've learned so much from from the from students in the schools and they've given me so much education and they've taught me so much and all i have to do is listen to them and try and guide them and help them give them that support and also to you know to ask them if i can hug them and they will allow me and then yeah the other, the other week i was talking to a young man that had been a victim and i told him when i asked him if i could hug him he said please and i he did and i was hugging him and i said you know every child matters because every child matters to you know every child matters to me i said every child is special and every child that I come across, I said, I love every child. I said, and I said, I love you for who you are. And today, you know, part of the reconciliation, truth and reconciliation, they did a study called the Royal Commission study across Canada. And Prime Minister Stephen Harper was the Prime Minister at the time. And this matter was, was brought up we started, it started the delegation for a lawsuit. And the Prime Minister Harper said, I want the truth. So they interviewed thousands of us across Canada to tell the truth, to talk about the truth of what happened at the residential school. He heard the truth. And now we were the first ones to speak. My mother would have been one, but she passed away. And uh, a lot of our elders do not want to talk about the the uh, the abuse. It's too dramatic for them. It just reopens the past, and they don't feel safe. And this is where that intergenerational trauma takes place. I've done with I've taken care of mine. This is why. My children went to school, graduated. Then my grandchildren, my great, -grand you know, my grandchildren went to university. I broke that cycle because I'm able to talk about my story. My story has been dramatic. My story has been rewarding, and I'm not afraid to to speak anymore. I will tell the truth even when I'm asked, when I'm given protocol to speak at a wake. I will bring out, I will always go to the family and say, what should I say? And if it's trauma and alcohol, it goes back to the residential school. So my journey in the last 50 years has been amazing. Laura, given all that you've shared and you know your story of resilience and and strength, uh, what does what does decolonization mean to you um, as you're going to share with this new audience in Ireland? Well, first of all, I'm going to have to go back to colonization. How the um, how the Europeans came and how we weren't the only ones that were being colonized and how they took control it was about control and how we were controlled at the school how we were molded to what they wanted out of us you know remember i said they wanted to kill every indian in every child that was their number one goal and they wanted us to be the to be like them to be white to think like them, to talk like them, think like them, to feel like them. It didn't work. It worked when we were in a school because we were controlled. It wasn't until later in my life that I learned about decolonization. But I always knew that there was something about the school that I could not understand. And there was four questions that I read last night. That was what it was all about. It was all controlling. Just one more question. Um, and you've, you've shared so much already, uh, but your story is really 
about healing and and leadership. Um, who are some of the people that helped you during these struggles? And you mentioned listen to children, and I'm I'm thinking your grandchildren are also people that have helped you during these struggles, and even the children that you've worked with. Who, but yeah. who are some of the people that have helped you kind of lift you up um, during One of these the, struggles? Yeah. One of the first people that I ever heard was, uh, he was a grand chief. His name is uh, Phil Fontaine. He's still around. Here it was this, this indigenous, indigenous man. He started talking and he said, I just want to share my story out there. I am a survivor from the Indian residential school, he said. He said, I, w I went through a lot of abuse. But he said, there's one thing that I need to bring out. He's something like that. He said, I'm also a victim of sexual abuse. I just sat there. This was the first time I heard from a survivor, Phil Fontaine. I said, oh, my God. I've been at the school myself. Was there a lot of sexual abuse? See, I had learned to suppress that. It wasn't until later I talked, I talked, I, I was able to talk about my story. And then I met Phil Fontaine. I took a picture of him and I said, I want to share something with you. You were the one that guided me when you spoke on TV with your experience at the residential school. I want to thank you, I said, because I always remember you. You guided me to where I am today. I said, you're a great leader. I said, thank you. I got to meet him in 2002 when the when the Pope came down. See, the Pope came to our reservation and I had to, you know, I had to start working with forgiveness. I had to learn to forgive that priest. I had to learn to forgive the nuns, the you know, the sisters for the way they they treated us, the way they abused us. Because some of those sisters, those nuns were also abusing the boys. And I had to work with that. And so that when the Pope came, I had to learn to forgive and I did it right there. And after that, I was free. I was able to go on with my life. I was able to let that go with the creator. Just thinking about the ways that, you know, as you mentioned, colonization has encroached on our lands and even our bodies. Uh, what do the front lines of indigenous resurgence and resistance look like for you? And I'm thinking, wow, based on what you've said so far, it seems like the family is really a a key part of that and kinship in our community. But what, is, what does that look like for you? We have a lot of hope because we're strong. We're a strong nation now. Because there was a time in our lives as when I was younger, as I was growing up, it was the government that always dictated to us, to our leadership, what should be done, what they approved and what they didn't approve. We need to keep fighting with the... Uh, overcome that dictatorship. We have to overcome their policies. We have to continue working in what we believe, you know, because we are a strong nation. And when everybody makes that move, like my grandfather said many years ago, our people are gonna get smart. When they get smart, they're gonna start talking like them. Because now we have lawyers. We have all these um, historians. It's, you know, we have researchers. We have the legal team. We have all these resources that we needed 100 years ago. But we have them today. And we need to continue sharing and working together. And to help the youth, to guide our youth. And even the elders that you, we have, you know, we need to teach, you know, we need to embrace them, even if they haven't told their story. We got to give them that support because we know they've gone through what I, probably what I went through and they're ashamed to talk about it. There's one lady, one day I did an interview with her and she started telling me her story. After she's, she told her story story with me. She said that she got mad at me and she started swearing at me. I just stood there and said, uh-oh, she's going to beat me up now. 
because she talked about her sexual abuse. And she said, I had promised to myself that I would never tell my story to anybody. I should beat the hell out of you for what you did to me. I didn't say anything. And, but we, we became good friends. And she said, I never wanted to talk about the shame because it was that priest brought me, brought, gave me a, you know, it was, I was very shameful for what he did to me. And I told her, you weren't the only one. There was a lot of us. I said, there were girls that were being raped in this church. I said, you were not alone. I said, there's lots of us. I said, there's a lot of anger. I'll tell you that. I said, don't worry. I said, you brought it out. I said, now you'll feel much better. I told her. Well, spoken like a true warrior. I, I really am honored that you, you spoke with us today and um, really talked to us about the importance of, of, listening to children, but also breaking the cycle. And yes. you've truly broken through that cycle and are uplifting so many other people through your story. And so thank you, Wado, for sharing with us today and, and taking the time. And we're honored to, um, to share your story. Mm -hmm.